Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our fourth lesson on navigation. We're going to be discussing navigation computers. Some people also call these flight computers. So quick review from previous lessons. We have uh, true tracks and magnetic tracks. A uh, track is the, uh, the direction that you're moving over the ground. We can have that with reference to true north and or magnetic north. So magnetic track is true north adjusted for the variation and aligned with the magnetic north pole. Recall that uh, the magnetic north pole and the true north pole are not the same position. So that means that there is a compass variation, the difference between magnetic and true north. And so this variation has to be corrected for. It can be up to 40 degrees off in the Arctic regions. So the true heading plus or minus the variation is the magnetic heading. And the way to remember it is add west, west is best, east is least or subtract if it's east. So if you have a true track of let's say 90 degrees and you're looking at a map and it says the variation is two degrees west, west is best, add. So 90 plus two, 92 degrees would be your magnetic uh, track. Uh, the deviation, compass deviation, is typically below uh, less than two degrees, and it, it's pretty much negligible uh, for your um, calculations. You can see here is a worldwide map with uh, lines of variation on it. You can see some of them, uh, you know, each line is a certain uh, number of degrees. The agonic line, so zero degrees, goes pretty much through Thunder Bay. You can see the green line on the left side through... Uh, and that has zero degrees variation. And then red would be west variation and then blue is east. And so you can see uh, like south of Australia here on this map, uh, that would be like the magnetic south pole shows up here. And you see how close together they are. And, uh, and in these areas, you, you're going to have a lot of variation. Just to recall that true heading is the heading with reference to the true or geographic North Pole, the magnetic heading adjusts the true heading for compass variation. Compass heading adjusts magnetic heading for internal compass inaccuracies. That's called deviation. So here's an example. We're flying from the Kekabeka Falls Airport to uh, Shabanawan or Kashabawi Water Aerodrome. We're going to have it, if we measure it, we're going to have a track of 295. I'll explain later how to actually, um, in the next lesson, you'll learn how to fill this out. But you have a true track here of 295. We're going to correct for the wind, have a true heading of 292. And we have a variation of three degrees west. So that means the magnetic heading would be uh, 295, right? Because we add that on there. There we go, magnetic heading of 295. We can do the same thing as well on our trip uh, earlier. Uh, we had, for the true headings, 297 uh, above here, three degrees west, and then we end up with a magnetic heading of 300. Recall indicated airspeed is the airspeed indicated on the airspeed indicator. The calibrated airspeed is the indicated airspeed corrected for position errors of the pitot tube. You're going to get this information from the POH for correction. So here it just tells you, uh, let's say flaps up or is really the one that we're most concerned about most of the time. And uh, it's usually, it's within about two knots or so, the calibrated airspeed at, uh, at high speeds, at typical cruise speeds at like 100. So it's like 99, but you can see at low speeds where this high angle of attack down here, you can see the indicated airspeed might indicate 40, but it's actually 49 knots you're traveling, so it's nine knots off. So the true airspeed is the speed through the air. We would uh, obtain this information from the pilot operating handbook, given the altitude, temperature, and power setting that we're planning on flying. Uh, conversely, the ground speed is the speed over the ground, so it's the true airspeed corrected for wind. So let's just review this. We covered this in flight operations a few lessons back. Say we're flying, we're planning to cruise at 4,000 feet. We want to have 2,400 RPM. We go in a standard temperature, go across at 91 knots. So the uh, true airspeed we can plan on is 91 knots in cruise. 
we can talk about dead reckoning. Dead reckoning uh, is what we use or what we can use that allows us to fly to a destination with no visual navigation, provided the winds are accurate and we maintain the calculated heading. So this would be, we always use kind of a, a combination of pilotage, so looking at landmarks and dead reckoning. We plan as if we had no landmarks and we just had to go out there and fly a heading based on the winds and get to our destination. But there's always going to be small corrections that we're going to make based on, uh, based on the landmarks that we see in our map. Okay, but we are going to learn how to dead reckon. And uh, it's come in really handy a few times in my career. One time in the Northwest Territories, I was flying at night and uh, at a failure of the GPS unit and there wasn't much to go on. And uh, I just had to fly a heading until thankfully 200 miles later, I was able to see the lights of the city that I was flying to, but there was really no landmarks. I was just flying uh, with a heading that I had calculated. So when we're doing our calculations for dead reckoning, uh, there's something that comes up, a triangle of velocities. Now you're not actually expected to do this, but this is kind of the, the mathematical basis for what we're going to uh, figure out. So we know our track from distance A to B, we know our true airspeed, and we know our wind velocity. So what we need to find out is our heading and our ground speed. So we could use a cosine law to solve or a flight computer. So we use a cosine law to resolve the vectors, or we could use an app. Unfortunately, aviation or the regulators in aviation are inherently conservative. And if their grandfathers learned to fly using a flight computer, then well, you're going to learn to fly with a flight computer too. But this is kind of good to know anyway, something in, from first principles in, in the back of your mind. So we're kind of stuck halfway in between the iPad and an abacus. So these are the two main types of flight computers, manual flight computers. On the left is the uh, Jeppesen CR computer, and on the right is the E6B computer. I think the E6B are a bit more popular. Uh, something kind of funny, uh, my father had one of these old CR computers, and the manual for it was written in probably like 1960, and it had this funny guy who just made incredibly sexist remarks uh, throughout. It was, it was, well, rather funny when I was a teenage kid, but I don't think they're publishing that anymore. Uh, jokes about patting women on the bums and, and things like that. Somewhat inappropriate, but I guess that was the 1960s when all men or all pilots were, were men. A flight computer has two sides. The first one is to calculate distance, speed, and time, as well as uh, true airspeed based on calibrated airspeed and altitude. The second side, side is used for calculating ground speed and heading. Here's a video on calculating heading and ground speed using the E6B flight computer. In this tutorial, we'll be using the wind side of the computer to calculate ground speed and true heading. There's two parts to the wind scale. There's the low speed portion of the wind scale which has speed values along the center line and they do not have units and I believe they will work equ equally well if it's miles an hour or knots but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that and along the lateral axis we have the variation in heading angle due to the wind so we have 5, 10, 15, and 20 if we take the wind index card and flip it over we then see we have the high speed uh, portion. The spacings are much larger in the high speed region. And we've got 200, 250, 300, all the way up to the top, which is 650. You'll also notice that on the side, we have a scale. And that scale you can use on aeronautical charts. Here we can see statute miles on this side. And if we flip it over on the other side, we've got nautical miles. So let's do a simple problem. I'll just make one up right now. We'll assume we're flying in a Cessna, so we're going low speed. We're going to take the rotating azimuth card. We're going to place that into the wind, uh, wind card, like so. And so 
the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go and get the weather before we do our flight. We're going to find our winds aloft. So what we will do is we will assume that the winds are coming from a heading of 060. So we'll line up 060 with the top of our true index. Now you'll see here we have the variation in wind speed. All you have to do is line it up with one of the solid lines and every tick mark is going to be about two units of change in wind velocity. And so for this problem we'll assume that we've got a 22 knot wind. So what we'll do is we'll go up 10, 20, and then one small tick mark and we'll draw a little circle and that will be 22. And keep in mind that the wind is always given to you in terms of a true heading. So the wind that you get from the website, the FAA website, aviationweather.gov, or if you call the weather briefer, will be a true uh, wind heading. Next what we do is we will rotate the index until we get to the value for the heading that we're going to fly that we determined from the map. This is the true heading. It has not been corrected for magnetic variation yet. So let's assume that we're going to go at a heading of 030. So I'll put 030 at the top of the wind index. Next, we're going to pick a fl an airspeed that we're going to fly at in cruise. So for a Cessna 172, let's assume that we're going to cruise at 75% power, which is about 110 knots. So what I'll do now is slide this card until the dot that we made is lined up with the 110 marker line. So we can then see if we look at our scale the grommet which is at the center of this rotating ring is just above 91 excuse me um yeah, it's at about 91. So our ground speed is going to be 91 knots, but our airspeed measured in the aircraft on the airspeed indicator is going to be 110 knots. And we can see that the variation is going to be 2, 4, 5. So it's going to be about plus 5. If we're on the right side of the scale, we're going to add. If it were if this dot happened to fall on the left side of the scale, we would subtract. So we're going to go at a heading of 030. We're going to have to add 5%, excuse me, uh, 5 degrees due to wind drift so that we will fly at a heading of 030 plus 5 or 035. So we'll go at a heading of 035 and a ground speed of 90 knots and we'll use that to then calculate the heading when we add in magnetic variation and then we will also use the ground speed to calculate how much time it will take and how much fuel it will burn for each portion of the leg of our flight. Here is a video on calculating heading and ground speed using a CR flight computer. Hi guys, it's Matt here from pilotpracticeexams.com where you can pass in half the time. So this is a quick video on using the Jefferson CR4, or you can use any of the similar ones, doesn't have to be the CR4, on how to calculate your wind drift, your heading correction, and therefore your ground speed. Um, so what we want to do is basically for the beginning pilots is we want to work out how far the wind is blowing us to one side, which it nearly always is unless it's a direct headwind or tailwind, and also how that will affect our ground speed because that's going to affect the time intervals between each location and our fuel burn. So let's take a quick look. Now please be a little bit forgiving with this. Um, the video is being shot upside down for me, so if I do take a little while to explain it, that's why. So let's have a look. So the outer scale, the first thing you do is you set, this is your true airspeed. You see you set it to your aircraft speed. If it, if it was 90 knots, you'd set it there like that, okay? But for this case, we're going to go with 100 knots. The green scale, you set the wind that is blowing at the top. So in this case, it's 090, okay? If it was, say, 150, then I'd set that around there at the top. 
Then what you do, this scale here, okay, if I'm heading directly into a 090, then that's going to be a headwind. Now this uh, here represents headwind, this represents tailwind, and that's wind from the right, wind from your left. Okay, so what we do is we put a circle, let's say we're going to have 20 knots. We put a circle around 20 with the center of the circle on on where that vertical line intersects the 20. If it was 15, then you just estimate. Now, when it comes to your exams, they should not give you a question that has two choices that um, you could get an error factor on your calculator and get the question wrong. So don't freak out about that. Okay. Occasionally, they might give two that are reasonably close, but generally they give one that's sort of further away in the wrong direction. Okay, so now we have put that if we're heading 090 at, um, and we have a 20 knot headwind, then we have a 20 knot headwind. So now let's look at, the second thing we want to look at is we want to put the heading that we're going to head at the top and see what happens to the wind. So let's say that we're going to head 060, which is there. So now what I do is I put that at the top. And that now tells us what our actual wind is relative to where we're going to head. So our actual wind is off to our right, and notice that it is slowed a little, because it's not a pure headwind component now. So all we need to do now is we read off from this scale here, okay, across to the middle of the circle, how many knots of headwind we have. So in this particular case, it's 16 knots of headwind, roughly. So our new ground speed is going to be 100 minus our headwind component, which is 16. So our ground speed is actually going to be 14 knots. Okay. So now if, you know, if that had ended up, say, around there, that would indicate that we have a tailwind of around about, say, 14 knots. Right. So, but anyway, let's just reset this. So it's 060 at the top. We've got 16 knots of headwind. So our, uh, our ground speed is going to be 84 knots. But what about how much do we need to adjust for that wind that's coming from our right? Okay, so what we need to do then is read off this column to see what sort of side wind component there is. Now in this case, um, it's basically 10 knots. So all, the, all we do then is we come around this outer scale here to 10, which is there, and we go in 1. Now you notice that's 8, 7, 6, and 5's there. So 10 is closest to 6. So we need to adjust 6 degrees. Now which way do we need to adjust? Well, we're heading 0, 6, 0, which is basically sort of northeast. And the wind's coming from 0, 9, 0, which is basically east. So that's going to be on our right. So we need to adjust 6 degrees. Instead of he heading 0, 9, 0, we need to head 0, 9, 6. Okay? Because that way we'll be heading further to the right and we'll get blown back to 0, 9, 0. So guys, I've got a bunch of other videos on this and NAVs and other planning stuff. Just head over to my YouTube channel. Please give me a like, a share, or a comment, because that is the only way that YouTube knows this stuff's worth sharing. And I'm Matt from pilotpracticeexams.com, where you can pass your exams in half the time. Here's a video on calculating pressure, density, and true altitude. In this example, I'm going to show you how to use the E6B flight computer to calculate true altitude. Let's assume we're flying along and we're going to go over a mountainous area that has a maximum altitude of 5,000 feet MSL. It's a cold day, so the performance of our airplane is pretty good. In fact, it's a little bit better than on a normal day. And so we're feeling a little bit bold and we're going to have a clearance of 500 feet above the mountaintop, which is the minimum altitude recommended by the federal regulations in an uncongested area. So our altitude is going to be 5,500 feet. So we're motoring along at altitude, and we do a quick calculation as we're approaching the mountain to see what our true altitude is going to be. The first thing we're going to do is note the altimeter setting 
and in our case, for this example, it'll be 30.42. We're also going to record the altitude that we measure for our current setting, which is 5,500 feet. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to set the altimeter to 29.92, and then we're going to measure what the corresponding pressure altitude is. So once we adjust the pressure altitude setting to 29.92, we see that the altimeter reads 5,000 feet. So we now have our pressure altitude, which is 5,000 feet, and we have our outside air temperature, which is minus 18 degrees Celsius. So the first thing we're going to do on our E6B is we're going to line up the pressure altitude with the outside air temperature using the window over here. The inside scale is the pressure altitude, and the outer scale is the outside air temperature. So let's line up 5,000 feet with 18 degrees Celsius. So we now have 5,000 feet lined up with 18 degrees Celsius. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look on the inside rotating ring for the altitude that we measured before we set the altimeter to 29.92. And that altitude was the altitude we had planned originally, which was 5,500 feet. So let's look at 5,500 feet on this scale. And we'll find that right here. In order to calculate the true altitude, all we have to do is jump to the inner scale. When we do that, what we'll find is that the true altitude is 5,000, 5,050. So we are going to clear that mountainside by only 50 feet when we calculate the true altitude, which corrects for non-standard temperature and pressure. In other words, you're going to have controlled flight into terrain. Now, if this was a day flight, you might see the mountain go up and avoid it or turn around and go away from the mountain. If you're flying at nighttime and that mountain is completely unpopulated, it's going to look as black as the sky around it. You're not going to see the mountain and you're going to fly right into it. So whenever you're doing a flight, it's very important if it's a cool day to calculate your true altitude to make sure that you have adequate clearance over any obstacle you might be flying over and you want to have at least a thousand foot margin of safety in case you forget to do this calculation. Hopefully you won't, but 500 feet minimum clearance altitude can very quickly get you into trouble as we've just shown. And it's that easy. Here's a video on calculating calibrated airspeed and true airspeed on your flight computer. Hey guys, so uh, I just want to make a video here of how to calculate um, calibrated airspeed with your E6B. Um, I'm studying for my instrument training right now, so I was just going through some of the questions here and I got to the calibrated airspeed questions and I was having some trouble trying to figure out how they got the answers um, using the E6B and how to, just basically how to do it, you know, how to solve the equation. And so I went online and I was looking for some videos on how to do it and I didn't find anything. And uh, so... If you don't know already how to do this, um, hopefully this video helps you. So uh, the first question here is, uh, what calibrated airspeed must be used to maintain the file true airspeed at the flight planned altitude if the outside air temperature is plus eight degrees Celsius? So they say use uh, figure 32 on page 28. So we're gonna go ahead and go to page 28 here. Um, so you got to have three things to be able to calculate cal calculated air speed. So the, th the three things you have to have is you're going to have to have your cruising altitude. So if we go over here to 2.8, our cruising altitude is 8,000 feet. 
We're also going to need our true airspeed, which is 180 knots. And then we'll need the temperature, which they gave uh, gave to us on, on the other uh, page here. So we'll go back, which was plus 8 degrees Celsius, which is our temp. So how we go ahead and calculate our calculated airspeed here is we're going to pull up our E6B now. So what you want to do is you have your pressure altitude window here and right above it is the temperature. So what you want to do is you want to get your pressure altitude opposite of your temperature. So you want to line them up. So we're going to go in here. We're going to start at zero and I'm going to work my way up for you guys. So here's the zero degrees Celsius. We're going to start at zero degrees Celsius. So we're just zero and we're going to start at zero thousand feet. So what we want to do is we want to align up um, our pressure altitude with our temperature. So this is our pressure altitude window and our temperature right above it here. So we want to go ahead and uh, make those two opposite of each other. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to start at zero, zero. So I have the zero temperature and the zero altitude on together there. And what we're going to do is our, temp our, our altitude is 8,000 feet. So we're going to work up to 8,000. So here we go. We're going to move our temperature zero above the thousands down. So we're going to go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000. So now we're at 8,000 feet pressure altitude and we're at zero degrees Celsius. So now we need to go ahead and put our eight degrees Celsius over the 8,000. So here's our zero here. Here's our five degree mark. Here's our 10 degree mark. Our 15, our 20, our 25, our 30, our 35, our 40, our 45, and our 50 plus 50 degrees Celsius. So we're plus eight degrees. So we're gonna go, here's five. And it's just gonna be just past that line, just past that first little line there. So we're going to go ahead and move that little line to our 8,000. So now we're at 8,000 plus 5, and then we got to turn it just a little bit more to get our 8. we got to be pretty precise, very little movement here. So we'll say that's our 8,000 feet right there. Or sorry, our 8,000 feet with 8 plus 8 degrees Celsius. And then, all right, so then after you align your altitude opposite of your temperature, you're going to go ahead and now you use your true airspeed. You're going to find your true airspeed on the outer scale here. Because right now we're working on the inner, inner circle here. Now we go to go on the outer circle to find our true airspeed. So we're going to leave this where it's at and we're going to go ahead and find our true airspeed, which is 180. So 180, um, we'll just, we're going to count that as 180. We're going to pretend there's a zero at the end there. 180. We're going to come down to where we hit the inner circle here. So we have one. 52, 154, 156, 158, and 160 here. So we're going to go backwards here. So we're 160, and we're at 158. We're not quite 158, but we're at 157. So we're at 157 there. So we take our 180, come down. Where does it hit on this inner circle? It's at 157. So our calibrated airspeed is 157 knots. And let's go ahead and make sure our answer is correct here. So what color airspeed must be used to maintain the filed true airspeed of 180 knots at the flight plant altitude, which is 8,000 feet, if the outside air temperature is plus 8 degrees Celsius? The answer would be B, 157. So we'll go over here. The answer is B. All right, guys. So uh, I hope this helps you out. Um, I was looking on how to figure this out myself, and then I finally figured it out. I thought I'd share it with you guys because I don't see much out there on uh, calibrated airspeed. So uh, I hope this helps you guys out. Um, if you liked what you saw here, go ahead and uh, subscribe to my channel, and I got more aviation videos coming up here uh, shortly. Thanks, guys. Here's a video on calculating time, ground speed, and distance on your flight computer. This video is from M0A Flight Training. I have a link to their YouTube channel uh, in the comment section below.
Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com. I wanted to give you kind of a sneak peek inside of our online ground school as to what we're doing. We just finished shooting and filming an entire E6B, manual E6B flight computer segment. 15, almost 20 minutes worth of content. And I wanted to show you one of the private pilot FAA written test questions, how you can best answer it and kind of let you again, see inside our online ground school, how we teach and everything else. So it'll be kind of fun. Let's go ahead and look at our question here together. It's time, distance, and ground speed. The question, again, this is right from the FAA database, says, what is the estimated time and route from the Sandpoint Airport, Area 1, to the St. Mary's Airport, Area 4? The wind is from 215 at 25 knots, and the true airspeed is 125 knots. Well, first things first, we need to look at that sectional chart. And I've pulled it up here for you so you can see it. You can see that Sandpoint Airport at the top in Area 1, and I'll draw a line straight on down to that St. Mary's Airport there, and I'll do a little bit of the legwork for you. Our true course on that is going to be a 181, and it's 59 nautical miles. So now, knowing that data, how can we plug that into our flight computer and get the proper answer together here? So now that we have this little bit of information, let's work through it together here. And we follow our steps that are listed on our flight computer. First things first, it says to set the wind direction underneath the true index. It says the wind is from 215 at 25. Pretty easy. Let's spin it on around to 215. Got it. At 25 knots because Step two says to mark wind velocity up from the center point here. And let me show you, I kind of like to cheat a little bit here. I like to move this all the way up to the 100 to make my counting a little bit easier. So you can see I've moved that to just about the 100 point. There, we're on the 100 point. So now when I say the wind is at 25 knots up from center, I can just look and see where that is. And I can put that dot right down there for you there at the 25 knot mark. Again, you could have done that from anywhere, but you need to do a little bit of counting. It's easy just to put it on the 100 and move up to the 25 knots that the wind is. Step number three says to set the true course under the true index. We did a little bit of plotting on that sectional chart for you and found out our true course is a 181. Let's move that around to our 181 that we've got there. Step four. Slide wind velocity mark, this mark we made right here, to our true airspeed. The question says the true airspeed is 125 knots. I want to take this and I want to move this to the 125 mark, don't I? So let's go ahead and do that real quick. I'll slide this down, get it just about right. Perfect. So I've slid that down. And the last step says to ground speed reads under center. So I look at my ground speed now and I go, okay, two, four. I'm looking at a ground speed of roughly about 104. I can see that headwind now. I can see that wind correction angle now. And most importantly, I know my ground speed because the question says, what is the estimated time in route? So now the question I need to ask myself is at 104 knots, how long is it going to take me to travel 59 nautical miles? Let's spin it around to our flight computer side. Our ground speed was what? 104. It says to set miles per hour in or knots, doesn't matter, underneath this black triangle, our true index. So I'm going to move that to our 104. This will work as the 100, 1, 2, 3, 4. I've got that locked in there at 104. And now you'll see that our distance is read on the outer scale, our A scale, and the time is read on our inner scale, the B scale. We're going to travel 59 nautical miles. So I'll come over here to 55. There's 60. Here's 59. I'll read straight down and get roughly 
34 minutes is how long it'll take me to make that trip. And you can see our answer there coming up on your slide of 34 minutes. It's a lot of work to get a simple answer, but this is an actual FAA written test question. These questions are going to come up on your check ride. These are the kind of skills you need to know to do a successful cross country diversion. I know you say, Jason, my iPad does this. My electronic E6B does that. That's all great, but you can't bring your iPad in with you to your written test. The examiner, the check right examiner could take your iPad away from you. You need to have a raw manual E6B skill to fall back on at the private pilot level. Trust me, you will need to have it despite what anybody else tells you. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Again, this is a quick kind of look into our online ground school. More questions like this, fuel burn, more time and distance questions. We go into great detail inside our online ground school. Groundschoolacademy.com. Awesome 4K ultra high def videos. If you enjoy my teaching style, if you feel I'm decent at breaking things into plain English, you're going to love our online ground school, groundschoolacademy.com. Check it out. Become a member today. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. See ya. You can also uh, calculate fuel consumption in the same method that we calculated time. Uh, the fuel flow is like speed, so quantity divided by time, and the fuel is the same as the distance. Av gas has a density of six pounds per US gallon. The other thing we can do is uh, look at the flight computer and align, let's say, gallons and liters. And uh, it will, we can use the flight computer to uh, make conversions uh, between different units. There's nautical miles and statute miles on there as well. So if we take the true track, we add or subtract the variation, we end up uh, with the magnetic track. We add and subtract or subtract the deviation, we end up with compass track. The calibrated airspeed uh, is found in the POH. True airspeed is calibrated airspeed corrected for air density. We can look at the POH to find our planned true airspeed. Then we look at our flight computer if we want to convert our indicated or calibrated airspeed to true airspeed based on the uh, temperature and pressure. Ground speed is true airspeed corrected for wind and is the actual speed over the ground. Let's work through some sample test questions. The, let's say the true track is 345, the variation is five degrees west and the deviation is two degrees east. So the magnetic track is. So there's some useless information here. The uh, deviation is useless. We didn't ask for the compass track, we asked for the magnetic. So five degrees west variation, so west is best, so we add five degrees. The correct answer, the magnetic track will be 350 degrees. Indicated airspeed is 75 knots, flaps 40. So we're looking flaps 40, 75 knots, we're halfway in between these. So it adds one knot on, so B, 76 knots. The Cessna 172 is traveling at 100 knots at a pressure altitude of 4,000 feet in standard temperature. What RPM is the engine producing? Trick question. This is a chart for a Cessna 150. Therefore, D, impossible to determine. That was tricky. Uh, that was cheap of me, and I apologize. Well, I don't really apologize, but you won't get anything like that on a test. I don't think anyone's going to do that one to you. An airplane flies directly north from Winnipeg to Upper Fort Nowhere. The distance is 100 nautical miles each way. The plane, airplane travels at 100 knots true airspeed. The wing component is 090 at 20. Without using your flight computer, the trip will take. So the question is, does it take two hours, longer than two hours, or shorter than two hours? So. This comes down to triangle velocities, and I'm going to explain it. Because at first you're going to say, well, it's gonna take two hours because it's a direct crosswind. So uh, the direct crosswind uh, doesn't add or uh, subtract to our uh, ground speed. As a matter of fact, it does. Our ground speed is going to be slightly less than 100 knots, okay? So I'm gonna draw this triangle velocities, okay? So remember, this is our true track. 
okay? And our ground speed over here, right? Then we have our wind right here. Okay, our wind 0, 090 0 at 20. Okay, and then I'll just make this one in red. Okay, this is our heading and our true airspeed. So our true airspeed is 100, knot, uh, 100 knots, true airspeed, right? That's 100. Think of this triangle. Think of your Pythagorean theorem. Actually, because it's 0, 9, 0, we can actually solve that very easily using the Pythagorean theorem. But you can notice here that this vector here, the ground speed vector, will be less than 100 knots because the one on the diagonal is 100 knots. The hypotenuse is 100 knots. So this one here, the um, adjacent uh, length of the adjacent side will be less than 100. So the trip will take longer than two hours. So here I put this triangle velocities in here as well. You can see you kind of lose out um, when you have a, a crosswind. Okay, so you need to figure out some data. We have a true track of 250 degrees calibrated airspeed of 100 knots, the pressure altitude of 5,000 feet at standard temperature, and the wind at 090 at 22. So the first thing we're going to do is figure out our true airspeed. So we're going to look at the front side of our flight computer, do some calculations. So we got 100, or sorry, we get 98 knots. Then uh, based on the 98 knots, and we know the wind, we can figure out our ground speed of 118 knots and our heading of 246 degrees. So work your way through that. You can pause the video, work your way through it. Just make sure you get the same answers as I did. Here's another one. Complete the missing data. A true track of 130 degrees. Calibrated airspeed 250 knots. Pressure altitude of 25,000 feet at minus 20. And the wind 190 at 85. So again, Use the front side of your flight computer, figure out your true airspeed. So you're going to need your calibrated airspeed, your pressure altitude, and your outside air temperature. Then use that true airspeed, go to the back side of your computer, plug it all in to get the ground speed and heading. So if you want, you can pause the video now, work your way through it, and then uh, start your video again for the answer. So we end up with a true airspeed of 385 knots, a ground speed of 335 knots, and a heading of 141 degrees. So hopefully you got the same answers as I did. Uh, can, these are kind of practice problems. The, guaranteed this will come up on your written test. Guaranteed it will come up on your private pilot license flight test. So just get really comfortable being able to do all of this stuff. Have it down cold and you'll, you'll do well on your uh, written test. I should mention as well, one of the issues with the navigation section on the written test is that there will be, let's say one calculation and then five questions afterwards. So they might have this question, but this question would be three questions, right? The first question would be, what's the true airspeed? What's the ground speed? What's the heading? If you screw up your true airspeed calculation, you're going to get everything else wrong. And so it's really important that you have all of these components down uh, down pat and so it, it comes to you really easily. That concludes this lesson. In our next lesson, we're going to uh, plan a flight, plan a practice flight. It's a very practical lesson.